Okay, we're going to talk a bit about CODIT. CODIT stands for Compartmentalization of Decay in Trees. Here's a photo of Alex Shigo. He was a, the pioneering researcher responsible for de developing this theory um, that has been crucial to arboricultural concepts surrounding decay and tree defense, active defense. So, first thing to notice uh, is we have four walls of defense. And these walls are listed in increasing order of strength. Strength as in uh, wall four is very strong and very good at resisting decay. Wall one typically fails or very often fails and has to be put up routinely. Um, I'm going to show you walls two through four on the next slide because they're easier to show in cross-section. Wall one you cannot show in cross-section. and The reason is because wall one is this, this wall that runs perpendicular to the axial plane, right? It runs transverse in the tree. Um, and so wall one is responsible for cutting off vertical movement. Vertical movement meaning movement up and down in the tree. So wall one is comprised of many chemicals and also tyloses. Tyloses are these, these plugs, right, that parenchyma produce to plug up the cells and to prevent movement of anything from water to, uh, to fungi from moving. And an over, an over exploitation, an overuse of tyloses can be a big problem for a tree. We're going to talk about vascular wilts later, but that's essentially the, the, the meaning of that. Um, for now, we're just interested in decay and how decay progresses. And so wall one is the weakest wall, and it prevents vertical movement throughout the tree uh, of fungi. So here are walls two through four. Um, again, increasing in order of strength. So wall two, the second weakest wall, prevents movement towards the pith. That's the easiest way to say it. It prevents movement from the outside towards the pith. It prevents radial movement from outside to in. And that's, it's crucial, not both ways. Wall two prevents movement from outside to in, not vice versa. Um, so it is this boundary on the inside of decay, preventing it from moving towards the pith. Wall three, um, <clears throat> which here it's kind of weird because wall three is really this. Wall three is the ray. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move here. Here's wall three. Wall three is, is essentially the path of a ray. Uh, it, is, it is the radial plane. The radial plane makes up wall three. You could think of a, a shield that if wall three is strong and wall two fails, let's say this wall fails, but wall three is strong here and here, you'll end up with what looks like a pizza slice. You'll end up with a triangle, right? So if, if the fungus is able to move past wall two into the pith, but wall three prevails, you're going to end up with a wedge-shaped decayed pocket. And that brings us to wall four, the strongest wall. This is also known as the barrier zone. Wall four prevents the radial movement of fungi from in to out. And a crucial thing to recognize about wall four, uh, in, in addition to it being the strongest wall, is wall four is only produced uh, the year of infection. It can only be produced uh, by the vascular cambium. So when wall four is produced, it can't just be produced in the middle. This wall four uh, was deployed however many years ago these rings are, if you count them, right? Wall four is initiated and, and uh, <clears throat> it's initiated and carried out from the vascular cambium, which means it occurs on the very outside of the tree, walling off decay from getting outside of what will eventually, in the future, be a sound wood, sapwood shell, right? So, this wood is now protected from wall, uh, by wall four uh, from decay. And so eventually many, many more rings will be added on. And if this wall holds up, uh, you'll have a rotten core. Let's say walls two and three all fail. You'll have a rotten core, but you'll have a thick wall, uh, a thick shell of sound sapwood. Granted, wall four prevails. Um, and so wall four... It's the strongest barrier, <clears throat> and very often it's the tree basically, when something invades, if the other walls are weak, wall four is the tree kind of giving a concession to the fungus. Not really, but I'm personifying. Uh, wall four is the tree saying, you take the core, and by core we mean the entire area of the tree when it was infected, when it deployed wall four. The tree is saying, you take this core, 
and I'm going to keep putting on healthy rings outside of this decay. And eventually, I'll insulate the decay in, I'll have sound sapwood, I'll have a strong wall four barrier, and it's just going to be a rotten or hollow center. But as we've talked about, the center of a tree is a neutral axis, and all of the strength comes from the, the ten, tensile and compressive strength, the tension and compressive strength that, uh, <clears throat> that cellulose and lignin, respectively, grant the outer shell. Right? So the outer shell is where the strength and the structural integrity of a tree is really held. Um, so the tree will make this concession and will say, okay, you take the center, I'm going to lay down a strong barrier and insulate you on the inside of this, of this sound wood that will now be produced outside. But basically the tree is forfeiting the entire size of the tree at the point it is invaded. It is, it is, it is forfeiting that entire space. This whole space will be decayed if walls two and three fail, which they commonly do. This entire space will be decayed and the tree will get away with what is now only a couple rings, but what will eventually be a ton of rings. So eventually this will be a tiny uh, forfeit, but right now it looks like a lot. Hopefully that makes sense. Walls two and three will often fail slowly, uh, right? And some trees are very strong compartmentalizers. We'll talk about that maybe if we get into an arboricultural class. Some trees are very strong compartmentalizers. Other are known, others are known for having uh, walls that, are, that very frequently fail. Um, and again, wall one is the easiest to fail, which is why typically in a tree, if you look over here, typically decay stretches a lot further vertically than it does <clears throat> horizontally, right? Decay is often confined to the inside in a narrow space in the trunk, very often, but stretches very far vertically, up and down. That's because wall, wall one very often, very typically fails, and so the fungus can move up, it can move down, but it's bordered from being able to move out um, laterally. And so that's the CODIP model. Remember, CODIP only takes place, uh, it only actively takes place in the sapwood. The sapwood has living parenchyma, the sapwood can respond actively. CODIP typically only takes place in the sapwood. Um, the heartwood, all it can do to defend itself is have extractives, right? It has these polyphenolic tannin compounds. Uh, it has compounds that passively defend it, but it cannot actively defend itself through compartmentalization. And here, here's wall four, see it's labeled, goes all the way around. Uh, here's like some wound wood, some probably highly lignified. There's probably very few vessels in this wood. Lots of lignin, this is where the, the, the initial invasion occurred. Um, but this wall four formed around the entire tree because it formed from the vascular cambium. Uh, when the tree was invaded, it formed from the vascular cambium. It, it's gonna allow, potentially allow this decay to keep moving. I mean, ideally, wall three stays strong, the decay doesn't move, but if it has to, it will hold wall four above all else and continue to put on new rings outside of wall four, insulating the fungus and rigidifying uh, its shell of sound sapwood. Wound wood we've talked about, this little red arrow depicts uh, wall four, the barrier zone. Wound wood forms outside of wall four, typically right next to the, here's this, this dead, looks like a, a wound of some sort, I don't know, you know, car backs into this, uh, you know, sometimes you see ax marks on a tree and you see wound wood surrounding them. We have a little bit of death here, but you'll notice that <clears throat> often this death doesn't go very deep, or at least if it does, it takes years for it to go deep because wall two and wall three are, are hold for a while, maybe until they start to, until they start to lose uh, strength. And wall four eventually is going to be the final deciding zone. Um, and wound wood is this highly lignified, uh, people often call it callus, it's not callus, uh, highly lignified wood that surges um, and it often, it can be devoid of vessels, right? So it's, it's, it's primarily concerned with structural integrity. It's compensating for the strength loss that occurs here, right? If you have a gap in a tree, you need these swollen uh, ram's horns, what they're sometimes called. You need these swollen pillars, and they're, they're ram's horns once these, these wound wood curtains close and begin to curl under themselves. They form what look like ram's horns. Um, but at this stage, you'll notice um, the wood here on the left and here on the right is much thicker than the rest of the shell, potentially, and it's much thicker because it's compensating for the lack of wood in the middle. Um, and I, I'll say because, you know, because is a, is a tricky word to use when we're trying to explain why an organism does something, but that is the effect it has, is this, ex this excessively strong, uh, excessively large wood 
uh, compensates for the missing or dead or decayed wood in the middle. And here is that ram's horn. I'll move out of the way. Ram's horns, this is wound wood that has curled into itself. Um, and these are like two pillars. I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't know what killed the tree. It, you know, someone cut it here, but um, these ram's horns are, are compensating for the lack of structural integrity in the middle here. Um, yep, and I'm not going to get into tomography, uh, but thank you all for joining.